Tech TV US Canada brings you news and views from White House and State Department. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you all today. Uh, I'm here one more time, uh, proudly to talk about freedom and free societies. And while America is not a perfect nation by any means, we always strive towards that more perfect union, trying to improve. We remain the greatest nation in the history of civilization. Uh, one of the good things that we do in this administration is our dedication to the protection of religious freedom all around the world. Last week, President Trump signed the first ever executive order that instructs the entire U.S. government to prioritize religious freedom. Here at the State Department, I've hosted the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom now twice. We've launched the International Religious Freedom Alliance. We've trained our foreign service officers to understand religious freedom issues much more deeply. And today I'm proud to release the 2019 International Religious Freedom Report. There is no other nation that cares so deeply about religious freedom that we gather accounts from all across the world. It's an enormous, it's a comprehensive accounting of this fundamental human right. Let me highlight a few positive elements we've observed in this past year. The Gambia, an International Freedom Alliance member, has courageously brought a case before the International Court of Justice regarding crimes against the Rohingya. The United Arab Emirates, long an ally for religious freedom in the Middle East, has become the first country in the Middle East to permit the construction of a temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In Uzbekistan, steps have been taken to improve its record on religious freedom, and those steps continue. I had a great chat with religious leaders when I was there earlier this year. We documented no police raids of unrestricted religious group meetings during 2019, compared with 114 such raids in 2018 and 240, 240 the year before that. These are great strides, real progress, the efforts of our State Department team showing or bearing fruit. But there's also a great darkness over parts of the world where people of faith are persecuted or denied the right to worship. The Nicaraguan government harasses and intimidates religious leaders and worshipers and desecrates religious spaces, often using proxies. In Nigeria, ISIS and Boko Haram continue to attack Muslims and Christians alike. ISIS beheaded 10 Christians in that country just this past December. And in China, state-sponsored repression against all religions continues to intensify. The Chinese Communist Party is now ordering religious organizations to obey CCP leadership and infuse communist dogma into their teachings and practice of their faith. The mass detentions of Uyghurs in Xinjiang continues. So does the repression of Tibetans and Buddhists and Falun Gong and Christians. I commend the report re released today to everyone. Its very existence is evidence of our strong resolve to defend human dignity. Ambassador Brownback, who's standing up here with me, will take questions from you after I wrap up my conversation with you all this morning. Speaking of China, last week I was humbled and honored to meet with several survivors of the Chinese Communist Party's massacre at Tiananmen Square that happened 31 years ago. I also released a statement on China's obscene attempts to take advantage of our domestic situation to press their political agenda which I'm sure many of you saw. There is no equivalence between our two forms of government. We have the rule of law, China does not. We have free speech and embrace peaceful protest, they don't. We defend religious freedom, as I just noted. China continues its decades-long war on faith. The contrast couldn't be more clear. During the best of times, China ruthlessly imposes communism. And amidst the most difficult challenges the United States faces, we work to secure freedom for all. And speaking of freedom, I want to say how happy I am that Michael White's back home safely. I want to thank our team led by Special Representative Brian Hook for the great diplomacy uh, that he engaged in that led to Michael's release. Uh, I want to thank the Swiss government too for their assistance. Uh, the work is not done. Bakr Namazi, Siamak Namazi, and Murad Tabaz are Americans still wrongfully detained by the Iranian regime. Tehran must release them immediately. Staying in the Middle East, uh, a brief comment on Libya. Uh, the agreement between the GNA and the LNA to re-enter UN security talks was a good first step, very positive. Quick and good faith negotiations are now required to implement 
a ceasefire and relaunch the UN-led intra-Libyan political talks. It's time. It's time for all Libyans on all sides to act so that neither Russia nor any other country can interfere in Libya's sovereignty for its own gain. Putting Libya on the path to economic recovery means preserving Libyan oil facilities and strong access to the National Oil Corporation. On Iraq, the government of Iraq has agreed to the strategic dialogue proposed in April. Uh, beginning tomorrow, uh, Under Secretary Hale will lead that discussion uh, with uh, representatives from Department of Defense, Treasury, Energy, and other agencies and their Iraqi counterparts. In keeping with previous dialogues based on our 2008 strategic framework agreement, the dialogue will cover all of the areas of interest between our two countries, politics, economics, security, culture, uh, and energy. With new threats on the horizon, including the global coronavirus pandemic, collapsed oil prices, and a large budget deficit, it's imperative that the United States and Iraq meet as strategic partners to plan a way forward for the mutual benefit of each of our two nations. A little bit closer to home, the Trump administration continues to work with our partners to sustain the great transformation here in the Western Hemisphere, to turn it into that hemisphere of freedom that we have talked about. That work must continue in bilateral and multilateral settings, why I'm voicing the United States concerns over the Pan American Health Organization's role in facilitating forced labor by Cuban doctors in Brazil's MICE medical program, during which more than 10,000 Cuban health care workers have allegedly been trafficked. PAHO must explain how it came to be the middleman in a scheme to exploit Cuban medical workers in Brazil. PAHO must explain how it came to send $1.3 billion to the murderous Castro regime. PAHO must explain why it did not seek the approval of the Executive Council, its own Executive Council, for its role in this program. And PAHO must explain who in the organization approved a potentially illegal agreement. And it must explain what it did with the $75 million it collected when it brokered this program. It needs to undertake perform reforms to prevent such things from ever happening again. And just as we did with the World Health Organization, the Trump administration will demand accountability from all international health organizations that depend on American taxpayer resources. Our money must support things that create value and support our values. The United States continues to stand for democratic values elsewhere in the hemisphere, too. We look forward to a quick, incredible conclusion to the vote recount in Guyana. We expect transparent and credible outcomes in the legislative elections in Suriname as well. And we continue to support the Venezuelan people in their quest for freedom. Let's not lose sight of how the Maduro regime has harmed Americans either. We call once again for the regime which has held six U.S. oil executives for more than two and a half years now, without a trial, to release each of these individuals. We also call on Russia to do the same for Paul Whelan, who needs to be released now. Rest assured, Ambassador Sullivan and his team will keep fighting for Paul. The United States will also keep our focus on Moscow's other human rights violations. Since 2015, Russia has conscripted thousands of Crimean men into its armed forces and imposed criminal penalties on those who do not comply. Russia must end its repression of those who oppose its occupation, release unjustly imprisoned Ukrainians, and return full control to the peninsula of Ukraine. Crimea is Ukraine. In brighter news, on the other side of the Atlantic, our consulate in Nook, Greenland, formally begins operations today. I'm excited about that. It took a lot of work, uh, and it's good news. It's the culmination of the administration's efforts to strengthen our engagement in the Arctic region, and a big thanks to Ambassador Carla Sands and her team in Copenhagen for help making this happen. We're grateful for the solid cooperations we've seen from Greenland and Denmark in making this day arrive. I was supposed to make a trip last year to announce this news, and I'm still hoping that I can make it up that way north. I know you'll all want to come along with me on that trip. Uh, one more item from Europe. I also welcome Albania's cross-party agreement on electoral reform, which will strengthen its democracy and further solidify Albania's European future. We encourage all stakeholders to codify this political agreement. On to Africa. The United States welcomes Congo's arrest of Trezor Mputo Konkonde, who was accused of involvement in the 2017 murder of UN experts Michael Sharp and Zeta Catalan. 
finding and apprehending him is an important step forward for the rule of law in the DRC and justice for the murder of an American citizen. More good news. We want to congratulate France on its announcements of operations that killed in northern Mali Abdelmalik Drugdal, the leader of Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. This is a big victory. We've taken another senior Al Qaeda leader off the battlefield, a terrorist threat who has presented risk all across the globe. And I want to mention briefly, too, an upcoming meeting General Secretary Xi is having with leaders in Africa on COVID 19. We've taken note of the very modest financial donations that China and so called private Chinese entities have dispersed in Africa. China's contributions to fighting the pandemic are paltry compared to the financial and human costs of the cover up that it engendered. And I note, too, our concern that China will exploit the pandemic as a pretext to continue its opaque lending practices that have led nations to debt and disappointment all throughout Africa. The United States has done and will continue to do enormous good work in Africa. PEPFAR has saved millions of African lives, and the U.S. is sustaining multiple programs in Africa to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll continue this remarkable humanitarian work as a reliable, transparent, and steadfast partner to our many African friends. And finally, I have an announcement regarding America's unyielding pledge of help for countries and people afflicted by a pandemic. First, I want to announce $14 million in new humanitarian assistance for refugees and vulnerable migrants. Second, President Trump is proud to help supply ventilators to countries all around the world. Today, we're providing nearly $180 million to support the purchase of those ventilators, as well as the training and support needed for these complex machines. So far, we've committed to deliver nearly 15,000 ventilators to more than 60 countries. I'm happy with that to take a handful of questions. Welcome back, Sean. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Sean, there you are. Sean, yes, sir. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask you about events in this country um, over the past week, the killing of George Floyd. Um, you've, and so you commented on Twitter about this, and you've, you've criticized China and Iran um, over their response, how you say they're exploiting it. Uh, but what is the message from the State Department? What is the message the United States projects to the world about this? Um, when we have greater attention to the racial disparities here in the United States, when you've seen the use of force in Lafayette Park, uh, what message can the United States have? Is it still in a position to, uh, to raise morally these issues like the ones we hear today about religious yeah. freedom? And the State Department itself, is there any more focus that you think should be done in terms of diversity in, this, in the State Department? Uh, well, I'll take your second question first. Since the day I arrived here, we've been very focused to make sure we brought every talent to bear all across the State Department, a diverse set of people uh, working from all across the country, of every race, of every, uh, of every nature, of every political persuasion to bring them here to execute Americans' diplomatic mission. I'm really proud of the work we've done uh, to make sure we have the right team, a diverse team here on the field. Uh, I think the statistics show that hard work by Carol Perez and her team and our uh, Department of Human Resources think they've done fantastic work at that, and it's important. It's important as we travel the world that our, our team represent America in a way that reflects the full glory and diversity of the United States of America. Uh, and and as, for, uh, as for your first question, you know, I, I think the question is, is so troubling, right? Because you ask the question assuming there is a moral equivalency between what takes place in these countries where they repress their people and they bludgeon their people, and they burn down their religious facilities, and they deny journalists, you all, the chance to ask a question of a Secretary of State, uh, just like the question you had the opportunity to ask me today and demand that we provide responses to you and hold us accountable. Those things don't happen in those nations. Our diplomats all around the world can be incredibly proud of the fact that they represent a nation that has God-given rights ensconced in our fundamental founding documents that ensure that when we get something wrong here in the United States, when something is as tragic and as awful as what happened to George Floyd takes place, that the government responds, right? We saw both local law enforcement and our Department of Justice move very quickly to address the particular situation. We've now seen people say, hey, we're calling for changes in the way law enforcement works. It's not my, it's not my space here as the Secretary of State, but you can see this debate take place in America. That doesn't happen in nations across the world. In Tiananmen Square 31 years ago, when thousands of people were massacred, instead they repressed journalists, they disappeared people. It was fundamentally different. Our, our nation is so special, 
And it's the greatest nation in the history of civilization. It is so special that challenges like the ones that we're confronting here in the United States today will be managed head on. There will be a political process that's engaged of. There'll be wide open debate. And our, uh, our core principles, the, the fact that we respect every human being because they are made in the image of God will be reflected in the way that the United States responds to these challenges. And I actually think I actually think our diplomats have this incredible opportunity to tell this important story about how America confronts challenges inside its own country in a way that reflects the finest of what our founders would have hoped America could achieve. Rich? Hey, Rich. Um, since we last spoke, Mr. Linick has testified uh, that the Undersecretary of Management tried to bully him on multiple occasions, uh, including an attempt to assume control of a leak investigation and dissuade his investigation of last year's arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Uh, is that accurate? And if so, is it appropriate? And is state currently looking into Mr. Linick? So I haven't had a chance to see the transcript of Mr. Linick's testimony. I understand it's now out. Sometime this morning it came out. I haven't had a chance to see that. So all I've seen is what the committee put out in its press release. Uh, here's what I can tell you. Uh, Steve Linick was a bad actor in the inspector general office here. He, he didn't take on the mission of the State Department to make us better. That's what inspector generals are supposed to do. They work for the agency head, that's me, and they're supposed to deliver and help make that organization better. It's not what Mr. Linick did. With respect to the leak, there's still work going on. I don't want to comment on it, other than to say that we have asked for a more thorough investigation than Mr. Linick had permitted. Mr. Link didn't do what he was asked to do, to respond to a story, I think written by one of you, that suggested that a couple of anonymous sources from inside his operation, I think it was referred to as people close to the investigation, had leaked a very politically sensitive document designed to destroy the career of a, of a professional State Department official. And that leaked, almost certainly, according to the report from his office. We asked him to investigate it in a certain way. He refused to do that. Uh, and that's inappropriate. And we still don't, as a result of that, know the answer for precisely how that information got out. Uh, we're determined to figure out how that information escaped, which was aimed at harming someone here. Uh, as I said before, my, my mistake was letting Mr. Lennox stay here as long as he did. He continued to undermine what it is the State Department's mission is aimed at achieving. Uh, we'll respond as appropriate to the various things Mr. Lennox uh, said when we get a chance to read the interview transcript. Uh, but I, 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 I'll, I'll leave it at that for this morning. I, I want to talk about foreign policy issues, the things that really matter. Okay, Christina. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, going back to your response to Sean's question, mm -hmm. respectfully, I wanted to ask you, not killing journalists or imprisoning dissidents surely cannot be the bar for American exceptionalism. My colleagues and I have seen firsthand this week on the streets police using nightsticks against peaceful protesters and actively targeting members of the media but we've heard no condemnation of these acts from the White House. And I'm wondering how and why this administration so vocally supports the rights of protesters overseas in Hong Kong and not the protesters a mile or so down the road from where you now stand. Oh, I think this administration has and continues to support peaceful protesters wherever we find them. We've not seen a statement from the White House against acts against journalism, against peaceful protesters being attacked by police. What is your opinion of those acts? For two and a half years, I have worked for journalists have the right to say whatever the heck they want. I come out and talk to you. You can ask me whatever question you choose, right? And I have. Well, you, and you have, and they're, you know, sometimes I like them, sometimes less so. This is, <laughs> this is part of the process. I, uh, I, I welcome that. Uh, with respect to the particular things that you suggested, I, I know there have been uh, concerns from some countries of their reporters having been treated inappropriately here. We've seen some of those uh, uh, allegations come into the State Department. Uh, you should know, and those countries should know, we will, we will handle them in a completely appropriate way. We will do our best to investigate them to the extent the State Department's capable of doing that, and we will address them in a way that is appropriate uh, to try and address any concerns those nations may have about their journals, who we, too, do our level best to protect. Whenever you, you've seen them, the international press travel alongside you, we do our best to take care to make sure that they get an opportunity both to ask questions of us and that they can feel safe and secure in doing so. What is your opinion of the protest? That's exactly it. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. We're going to have Sam now. All right. Thank you. Ambassador Brownback, you're up. Thank you all. Have a good day. <laughs>